Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bridgehead. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. If you want to check out any of our past shows, again, head over to thebridgehead.ca. We're also on SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. Today, I had a, quite a somber conversation uh, with a commentator who, in my mind, is one of the commentators everyone should be reading if they want to actually understand what's going on in today's world. I've had him on this show several times before, and that, of course, would be Peter Hitchens. He's the author of a number of magnificent books. Uh, the Rage Against God is my favorite. The Broken Compass is also incredibly insightful. The Abolition of Britain, I think, is important for anybody who wants to understand what's happening in Europe at the moment. And he's one of the few people who has consistently and all the way through resisted the idea that war in the Middle East is a good idea. Now, huge numbers of us thought that war in the Middle East when the Iraq war started uh, was a perfectly good idea. Many of us saw it as a logical progression from the war in Afghanistan and a continuation of the war on terror. And further to that, a lot of people bought into the Bush doctrine, which was very similar to the Reagan doctrine, and that was that fundamentally people wanted to embrace democracy and that this ethereal idea of freedom in the sense that Americans understand it especially, was something desired by people everywhere. And what we've instead found out is that we don't actually understand other cultures and other people very much at all. And in fact, many people actually value other things high above, or far more, I should say, uh, than freedom, which is why we've seen many of these nations disintegrate into sectarian strife. And so Peter Hitchens has been uh, warning consistently against war in Syria. And he's one of the few to be doing this. So many other people seem to think that bombing in Syria is a good idea. Very few people seem to be asking uh, why Assad would have pulled off the attack that he did. Uh, very few people seem to be asking why somebody who had by all, for all intents and purposes, actually won the civil war would then try to go to the international community with the use of chemical weapons, which I find to be to be very suspect, to say the least. And nobody seems to ask who is going to replace Assad and whether uh, that replacement would be any better. So I wanted to talk to Peter Hitchens about this issue, and I wanted to, to frame the question around uh, taking a look at the West's relationship with Russia, simply because I think that understanding Russia is so essential. Most of you will know that I traveled to Russia uh, last month for a couple of weeks. I spent time uh, with journalists there uh, doing interviews, trying to get a handle on the situation, uh, just trying to understand what was actually taking place, and, and my essays on that are appearing weekly over at the Bridgehead. And Peter Hitchens used to be a foreign correspondent actually living in Russia, and I think that he's one of the commentators who, who actually understands the Russian people. You guys should all go over to, to where he blogs, hitchensblog.mailonsunday.co.uk. Uh, you can read his updates there and especially his concerns about the way the West is moving at the moment. And, and further to that, I think that it would be a very good idea if, if people decided to take a, a step back and think about what's actually taking place. And I think Peter Hitchens does a great job of, of ensuring that everybody actually does that. So without further comment, here is my conversation with commentator and author Peter Hitchens. For starters, um, with all that's been going on lately about Russia and how toxic of a topic that has become, <clears throat> could you just explain to our listeners what the thesis of your essay, The Cold War is Over, was? But Russia is not the Soviet Union, most fundamentally, and people should not mistake the one for the other. Russia is not an ideological country driven by a desire to spread a series of beliefs around the world, uh, nor is it a global power. Uh, it has, for instance, scrapped and got rid of because it couldn't afford it, mainly, but it has, it has done so. The global navy, which it was building in an attempt to rival the United States on the high seas, which is always a precondition for anybody who's really interested in world power. It's also dismantled enormous armies, which used to weigh down the center of Europe and withdrawn in Europe alone from 700,000 square miles of territory. Its gross domestic product is about the size of Italy. 
Uh, it's uh, conventional armaments are one tenth the size of NATO's. Uh, it's grotesque to imagine that it's some kind of major world power. Uh, it's, a, it's a major regional power, uh, but its main concern is to defend its own integrity against internal and external threats. And there would be no reason to believe that it was a threat to anybody else. I'd add to that, which I, I, I didn't know at the time that I wrote the piece, but have subsequently discovered that NATO expansion uh, right up now to Russia's borders, so that there are now NATO troops 85 miles from St. Petersburg, uh, was the idea of the American arms manufacturing industry, which uh, was discovered by the New York Times in the 1990s to have lobbied very heavily and very expensively the Senate uh, to approve NATO expansion, uh, largely because it was afraid it was going to lose business once the Cold War came to an end. And this was opposed vigorously at the time by none other than George Kennan, the father of the Cold War, the author of the famous Long Telegram, which urged the containment of the Soviet Union back right at the beginning of the Cold War, a man who couldn't conceivably be described as a, as a Russian or Soviet duke, and he warned very strongly against the Clintonian expansion of NATO eastwards as a, as a dangerous thing, and also as, a, as an insult uh, to the many people in Russia who stood for freedom and democracy and who would be undermined by it. And I think he was quite correct. When we, we take a look at the situation as it unfolds, as I mentioned in our first email exchange, I just spent a couple of weeks in Russia over the election doing interviews, talking to people, and just trying to find out what their uh, perspective was. And one of the things that consistently came up is when the Soviet Union collapsed, and I had several journalists and other people I was interviewing bring this up, well, they wanted to know why the West didn't move in and institute a Marshall Plan that would have brought Russia to the point that everybody seems to think they should be. At, at the moment, where do you think the West went wrong in its relationships with Russia? Well, I, think that, I, I think that is something which, looking back, it's very easy to say. But I think some people did say it at the time, that a Marshall Plan equivalent would have been a good idea. Principally, we went wrong in two things. At the time, the great fashions in, in, in governmental thought uh, were basically neoconservative and beliefs in, in the, the power of the market. Uh, to cleanse and recreate, and also a ridiculous fetishization of the outward forms of democracy. So as long as you had a parliament, and possibly a president, and an election every so often, which appeared to be contested, you had democracy. Uh, this completely forgot the fundamental uh, nature of the rule of law uh, in any really serious political system. Uh, which was never developed in, in post-Soviet Russia or encouraged by the West. And so it, 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 you, you needed a, a three- or possibly four-legged stool, and we really only created one leg. When you were actually in Russia during the fall of the Soviet Union, what sort of things did you see and experience that have informed your view now? Because you're one of the few commentators who says we need to stop uh, and we need to we need to tone down the rhetoric and we need to have a real conversation about what happened so what what experiences did you have that led you to that perspective well i had many experiences to begin with I, quite early in my time in in, in 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 what was then the soviet union i experienced the truly savage nature of the soviet regime which for some many months afterwards bitterly prejudiced me against russians as such uh, and, and gave me a taste of the Russophobia, which I think is now fairly general in the West, uh, because I was in Vilnius in Lithuania in January 1991 and witnessed an incident which very few people know about because the first phase of the first Gulf War was taking place at the time, which is one of the reasons why Gorbachev did what he did. But uh, the Lithuanian nationalists uh, were, uh, were being quite active at the time in, in Vilnius and that suddenly... Uh, troops were sent in, uh, and the, the morning I arrived, they opened fire on a, on a crowd. And then in the evening, uh, they attacked uh, some points in Vilnius itself, particularly the television tower. And I was present during some of that. And the, they killed considerable numbers of civilians. And I saw the bodies in the makeshift morgue afterwards, which is how I know in detail what a human head looks like after a bullet has passed through it, uh, an experience which has never left me since. And they then gave a disgusting, lying press conference in which they pretended this action was justified and, and lied their heads off about what they'd done. 
Uh, and I was furious and thought that I was going to be arrested anyway because I think they, we thought they were going to round up. We thought that they were, they were going to round up the, um, the Western journalists in uh, Vilnius. So I escaped from that, uh, but they didn't. They didn't in the end do it. Though our Lithuanian friends spirit us away from hotels and put us up overnight to um, uh, to, to make sure that we didn't get captured. Uh, so I came back to Moscow after that in, in, in January 1991, a very bitter frame of mind against against Russians. Uh, and it took me a long time to learn to distinguish between Russians. So you mean two things helped? Uh, if I can, if I can, if I can carry on in this way. Yes, please. Uh, I feel I've been. Mean, the BBC would never let me speak for about one tenth this long. I'm, I'm slightly discombobulated by not being interrupted. <laughs> I wonder what. I wondered whether you were still there. Uh, but the point is that in the summer of 1991, uh, when the, the anti-Gorbachev putsch uh, came, which had some very strong support, and the, the head of the KGB favoured it, uh, a very clever uh, hardline communist called Boris Pugo, a Latvian, favoured it, and a number of other quite significant people did, and they appeared to have some, at least part of the armed forces behind them. I was very fortunate to be one of the very few Western journalists who was actually in Moscow when it happened. Most of them were on holiday. Most of them were on vacation abroad. By great good fortune, I had actually had my vacation earlier that summer and I was there. And I, the tanks actually came up my street, <laughs> a rather grand street uh, in central Moscow called Kutuzsky Prospekt, uh, which has a lot of rather fine Stalinist apartment blocks in it and where I lived at the time. And I thought, it's over. I thought, the the, the hardliners have come back. They're going to kill off this whole thing. We're going to go back to the deep freeze of communism. Basically, what I thought was that there was going to be a Russian Tiananmen Square. But they lost their nerve and it collapsed. And it collapsed with amazing speed. And the thing which I saw uh, a couple of days later after it collapsed was something which I've never seen. I repeat this every time I asked about this, and I'll go carry on doing it until it gets into the public consciousness. Every single trash can in central Moscow, in those days, the trash cans in central Moscow were, were made of some sort of grey metal, and they were urn-shaped, uh, faintly elegant, but not very, because they were often filthy, but they were all full, and they were all giving off clouds of, of pale grey or white smoke. And the reason for this, when I went and looked at them closely, is every single one of them was full of Communist Party membership booklets, oh. red and gold, burning. And it, people had just, it, all those people who had joined the Communist Party because it meant that they, they got better jobs or better apartments or promotion or their children went to a decent university, whatever it was that had forced them to make their compromise with, with Marxism and Leninism, which they did not want to do, they had all at that moment realized that this was over once and for all. And then a great collective gesture, they all burnt their Communist Party cards. And I saw that. Uh, a few months later, I was able to get into Sevastopol, the uh, the great naval station on right. the Black Sea, which has been uh, at the centre of some recent events as well. It's a very beautiful place, by the way, uh, but it, it, it's also um, uh, very important. And the thing that I saw at that stage, possibly, what, six months after the failure of the putsch, I couldn't say exactly, maybe a bit longer, but I, what I saw was in... In all the harbors and creeks and inlets, the warships of Sergei Gorshkov's global navy uh, scuttled. Some of them down by the bow, some down by the stern, some of them half tipped over sideways. But it was the wreck of a fleet. Right. It was all over. And again, you can see this is something immense. It was, it was a physical representation of a hugely important global political fact. Right. And it's never left me. Uh, this is the, the, this was the the end of the attempt of world power. They couldn't afford it anymore, apart from any other consideration. They also had no more ideological drive, which would uh, which would make it necessary. They they had become Russia again. And I began during all this as well to re reestablish good relations with Russian friends with whom I'd been on very cool terms after the Vilnius episode, and and to begin to see Russians as people rather than as ciphers in a in a kind of Mordor. And, and to educate myself much more on the, the, the nuances of, of Russian life, of the compromises that people had had to make. And then I saw the, the economic collapse, which came under Boris Yeltsin. I don't know if you've seen the film The Third Man. No, I haven't. 
well, it's amazing. You should. I don't astonish any any anybody could could come to adulthood without seeing one of the greatest films mm-hmm. ever made. It's uh, Orson Welles uh, basically playing a a black marketeer in post-war Vienna. It's based on a Graham Greene story, uh, and uh, without going into all the details, what he's basically doing is trading in in watered down illegal penicillin and, and killing people horribly as a result. But but he. Uh, <laughs> The backdrop of this is is post-war Vienna after the collapse of the Third Reich, and here's this once great, elegant capital city, and there's an opening scene of middle-class people selling their possessions, shoes, furniture, clothes, knickknacks, everything they own on you know, by the roadside to try and buy bread. And I'd seen this film many times, uh, but what I was astonished to find was to be in Moscow. It must have been, I think, in the... The winter of 1991, and to see middle class people standing by the roadside doing exactly what I'd seen in, in that film set in 1945. Uh, there they were in a major civilized city, middle class educated people selling their possessions to live. Their savings had been wiped out, most of them lost their jobs, they had nothing to hope for at all, and I saw a collapse, a catastrophe. And many people in, in, in modern Russia have endured catastrophe which we in the West will endure in our time it's coming to us but it hasn't yet and we're very smug about it so we don't realize what it does to you right now what's one of the things that really started me off trying to do research on what exactly was going on inside Russia was the fact that uh, here in Canada and the United States uh, otherwise very intelligent people uh, make claims about Russia that are, are transparently false. So there was a, 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 an essay, for example, in one of Canada's major national news magazines, and the title was, Vladimir Putin is the new Joseph Stalin. And I knew just based on, I've read several books on Putin, written by his critics, and even if he's guilty of everything he's been accused of, uh, to compare him to Joseph Stalin just seems hysterical. And I, I took oh, it's this, nonsensical. Yeah. So how do you, where does it's, it's this, where is this coming from? It's, it's, you, you, you either don't know anything about Vladimir Putin or you know nothing about Joseph Stalin, if you, if you, can, if, if, if you can say that. They're not the same thing. But with this kind of hyped-up rhetoric, I, I spoke to quite a few different journalists when I was when I was in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and this is the sort of thing that, that causes them to write off the Western media entirely, and they also... Well, and, 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 and reasonably so. I, why should you take seriously... Uh, people whose criticisms are couched in these terms. If you can't make the most basic distinctions, then everything you say really is like the clock striking 13, isn't it? it, it, it not merely this is, a, is the thing plainly incorrect in itself, but it casts doubt on everything that's gone before. It's just a, if somebody calls somebody who's mildly conservative a Nazi, right? Well, they've really lost any, any the respect of any serious person. It's, it's not the same thing, and, and to mix them up is just to show that you don't know the difference and you don't really know what you're talking about. And most people don't know what they're talking about with Russia. They think it's a place where bears walk in the streets and people have a funny alphabet and wear fur hats. Right. Uh, and uh, they have absolutely no conception of it as a country or a culture or a civilization. And so they're, they're very ready to dismiss it. With, with that in mind, then, when Boris Johnson uh, actually compared uh, Russia to, to Nazi Germany, um, <laughs> which was, was like, I, I only had to be, I was there for two days uh, in St. Petersburg for, for the beginning, and there was a 22-year-old student who gave us a tour around the city, and he was weeping uncontrollably in front of a World War II memorial. So surely Boris Johnson, yeah. as an amateur historian, must have known that those sorts of terms are deliberately provocative? Well, I think Boris Johnson's knowledge is very narrow. Okay. I, if, you want to, if you want to get into that classical civilization, he's probably quite good. Uh, but I think he knows very little about modern European history. Okay, and the, the, the real question that I, uh, this interview has been leading up to is why? Why is the West courting uh, a confrontation with Russia? None of the Russians that I, I met with understood why. Uh, in fact, I had one very uh, moving meeting with, with a journalist who actually said to me halfway through, do you think there will be war? Of course, I had, I had no idea, but I was shocked to be asked the question. Um, why is why is this taking place? Why the heightened rhetoric? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, and there doesn't seem to be anything in it for us. Wow! Well, no, no. This is the mistake people make is they they think that Russia is the main main front. Okay. The main front in the war towards which the Western nations are hurtling is in the Middle East, and it lies between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And this is made even more complicated by the fact that Israel, under its current government, has decided that Iran is its most dangerous enemy. 
personally, I think this is mistaken, but leave aside my own views on it. The fact is that this is so, and the Western nations have very much thrown in their lot with Saudi Arabia, a country with which they've had very close relations for many years anyway. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wouldn't speak for the United States, but certainly in the case of Britain, we're quite heavily dependent upon them for orders for our aircraft and, and weapons which we supply to them. Uh, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if we don't owe them quite a lot of money as well. And they have been driving a policy in the Middle East. The, 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 the confrontation between Iran and Saudi Arabia is the new confrontation between Russia and Germany in 1914, into which uh, every other major power, with the probable exception of China, which has got any sense will stay out of this and, and pick up the pieces afterwards, uh, could well turn into at least a semi-global war. And so you're saying Russia is sort of a, a bit player. It scares the off me. It scares the pants off me, especially with so many irrational, emotional, uh, ignorant operators in, in modern politics. I just uh, can see it could very easily developing into a very serious conflict, which would impoverish the world, destroy the region, and, uh, and quite possibly lead to, a, 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 at the very least, a limited war in Europe and possibly an unlimited one. Final question is, how should we be responding to this, uh, this Russian scenario? Despair. Despair. There is no other response. Despair. Protest about it if you like. Okay. The first casualty of war is truth. And the, and the reason why the first casualty of war is truth is when the drum beats for war, most people follow the drum. They want to believe lies and rubbish. Okay. My only advice to you is, disp my only advice to you is despair. Okay. Well, we'll have to leave it there then. If you've got a better idea, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear it. But I look at it, I try. I, I, I sit here in my own country. I'm surrounded by a kind of invasion of the body snatchers of people who once upon a time would have been skeptical of, 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 uh, of attempts to, to, to drive and propagandize them into war by American propaganda, but now seem to welcome it. Okay. I mean, not until, not, until, not until the rocket bombs start to arrive in Western cities will people realize how fantastically stupid they're being. Not until China becomes the supreme world power because we've destroyed ourselves with stupid wars where people realize how stupid we've been. I'm just beyond beyond all patience with it. It just drives me out of the wall with rage. Okay. Well, that, that somber warning is a good place to end. Thank you for taking this time. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a rather sobering conversation with British author and commentator Peter Hitchens. This show was brought to you by total rentals i hope that you found this show enlightening i'm not going to i'm not going to assume anybody enjoyed hearing that, those sorts of warnings but it was important to hear and, and i hope people do feel enlightened by this conversation i again it will be on youtube as well as soundcloud and itunes and if you want to check out any of the other shows go to the bridgehead.ca thanks for joining us this week and we hope you'll join us again next week